Today's lecture will introduce you to the biopsychosocial model. The biopsychosocial model is really the dominant model for health psychology. It's kind of a, an organizing uh, model of how we tend to think about health and health influences. And it has an increasing influence in medicine and healthcare, largely because of the uh, in, uh, strengthening influence of social and psychological and behavioral factors on the health of Americans today. Uh, what the biopsychosocial model does is tries to account for broader influences on health beyond those of the biomedical model. The biomedical model, of course, focused on uh, tissues and molecules and uh, germs and those sorts of things, kind of physical interactions with the environment. Um, and the biopsychosocial model tries to, it includes that. It certainly doesn't say that stuff is unimportant or uh, isn't there but it tries to add to uh, some additional information that helps us better understand and perhaps intervene with health problems. Now models like this are really important because they guide scientists at what variables to look at, what variables are important, and they also guide interventionists, those who are trying to make an impact on these problems, um, get important information about where should they be um, directing their interventions. Now, the historical roots of the biopsychosocial model go back uh, many, many uh, uh, decades, perhaps even a few centuries, uh, but most attribute the introduction of the modern biopsychosocial model to an important article by George Engel, uh, published in late 1970s, 1977. Now, one of the things to keep in mind as we sort of introduce the biopsychosocial model is a uh, levels of organization sort of perspective on how the world uh, is organized. Uh, what you see in this figure here is uh, sort of the organization of the world all from the smallest unit of analysis of subatomic particles and atoms and all the way to biosphere, biosphere meaning Earth. Now, of course, we probably could even expand this out to uh, solar systems and galaxies and whatnot, but uh, biosphere seems to be a reasonably large place to stop this. What you see in the middle is the person. So everything kind of below a uh, person in this model are things that are sort of integral or inside of a person. So nervous systems, organs, tissues, cells, uh, within cells, organelles, those sorts of issues. Everything above that are things that are outside of the person. And the smallest social unit there would be two people interacting together, moving up to families, communities, whole cultures or subcultures, societies and nations, and all the way up to biosphere. So uh, there's a lot of sort of different levels of unit of analysis with which we can look at and analyze things. Uh, this figure is basically the same idea, but but demonstrates how the lower levels in the previous figure are nested within the larger levels. So molecules certainly exist within biospheres and they exist within individuals or within uh, uh, systems. Um, that um, organs are inside of people, of course, and that people are inside of communities, families, etc. So this is a basic sort of fundamental idea of the biopsychosocial model. So the biopsychosocial model tries to, to look at those broader influences in which we are nested as people, in which we exist uh, as part of them. And this can include things like biological factors um, in our environments or in our communities. It uh, can include things like uh, genetic materials, function structure, physiology, immune system response, anatomical systems. This is mostly that stuff that was kind of below the level of person. And this is really the stuff that is the focus of a purely biomedical model. The biopsychosocial model adds psychological factors. Uh, these can exist within people like uh, behavior, choices, and decision-making, uh, but it can inc also include some uh, larger outside of the person uh, factors as well. And lastly, it includes lots of social factors. Social factors always exist sort of at one level beyond the person. Uh, it include relationships, the presence of social support, uh, families, communities, uh, physical environments, the availability of resources in that environment and can include uh, demographic factors such as socioeconomic status or SES, uh, gender, ethnicity, race, age, disability, and on and on. Now one of the things that makes uh, understanding health from a biopsychosocial perspective so challenging uh, is that it's super complex, of course. There aren't um, uh, straight lines from one thing to another typically. 
Uh, we often are interested and we like to talk about what we call main effects of various factors. Um, and if that were all that we had, the biopsychosocial model would be difficult enough. Main effects are things like A goes to C. So we might say things like the A might be um, one's, uh, the, the amount of saturated fat one eats in their diet leads to C, heart disease. And we know that there is certainly a link there between heart disease and diet, but it's not that direct. It's not that causal. There's a lot of things that influence it, make it uh, worse, or can protect against that risk. And so those are where things get really, really complicated. Because the truth is that it's interactions of factors, both within and across levels, that lead to almost infinite hypotheses or pathways by which a biopsychosocial factor can influence outcomes. Uh, sometimes these interactions are what we call mediators, or another word we use for that is mechanisms of causal effects. We'll refer to these sometimes as pathways. This is the A to B to C way that um, a factor A may influence an ultimate outcome B. Uh, so, for example, let's say we uh, were going to have a social media campaign to try to increase uh, knowledge of eating fruits and vegetables, or to try the outcome we're trying to influence is for people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And so we have an intervention, a social media campaign, that's the A, and our outcome is eating more fruits and vegetables. And we may find that that social media campaign A only has an effect on the outcome C, to the extent that there is a change in some variable in the middle, B. In this case, we might hypothesize that maybe um, an increase in knowledge of the importance of fruits and vegetables would be the important variable that links A to C. So we might say, does our social media campaign improve the consumption of fruits and vegetables? The answer might be yes, but only if it causes an increase in knowledge of the impact of the value of fresh fruits and vegetables. So that, that change in knowledge would be what we call a mediating variable or a mediator. It's the mechanism through which the intervention has its effects. Uh, sometimes uh, people think a more, an even more complicated thing is what we call moderators. Sometimes there are factors that change the nature of a causal relationship. We call these moderators. So a moderating variable actually changes the nature, for better or worse, of the impact of a variable A on an outcome C. So if we're looking at something like a social media campaign to improve the, the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, we might ask the question, well, does it does it change? Does a social media campaign result in a change of fresh fruits and vegetables? And the answer might be, it can, but it depends. And when you're talking about something that it depends on, that typically is a moderator. Okay. So in this example, we might say, well, it depends on perhaps the participant's age. And because maybe that relates to how much they're on social media, presuming maybe younger people are on social media more often and more familiar with it than older people. So we might say that a social media campaign that is designed to increase the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables is effective, but only for younger people. That would make age a moderator, because age, being younger or older, changes the answer of whether that campaign actually influences fresh fruits and vegetables. I hope that makes sense. So mediators are mechanisms, moderators change or moderate the influence of one variable on another. Uh, individual difference variables like gender, uh, age as I just mentioned, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, are often investigated as potential moderators. So we don't want to know uh, just a simple question of does A affect C, but we might want to know does A affect C among men and women the same, or among different ethnic groups, or among different socioeconomic uh, status groups, or maybe even among different communities or cultures because we may not presume that things operate exactly the same within different uh, groups of folks. Much of what we talk about throughout the course will highlight these relationships. This is important language to know about because we will be um, using it as we go out th throughout the course of how different things moderate or mediate uh, different outcomes. 
Last slide I want to show you here is just to give you an example of how this can be super complicated. This figure here is from an article by um, a, a well-known alcohol scientist named Ken Scher at the University of Missouri. I believe this was published uh, oh, in the early 2000s. This sh showed um, all the different ways in which a family history of alcoholism, that factor you see on the left side of the figure, can result in pathological alcohol involvement for an adolescent. Okay, So we know that does a family history of alcoholism result in more problematic alcohol use among, among kids with that family history? Yes, we know that's true. But we might want to know why. How does that happen? How developmentally does that happen? How does that unfold? What are the various factors at play that make that happen? Well, this figure with all those variables in the middle are the various mediators and moderators, different things that had been studied up to that time of how that could take place. And then the arrows you show that are shown in the picture illustrate whether something is potentially a mediator. Those are the things that are in solid lines. Or perhaps they're mediating influences, things that are in dotted lines. One of the things that I think is fun to do with this figure is to go through this figure and try to tell stories of how somebody might go from having a family history of alcoholism to being pathologically involved with misusing alcohol as an adolescent. Let me just try to take a couple of stories of how that might happen. So if you look at the top, you see parenting behavior. Well, we might presume that a family history of alcoholism might result in differences in parenting behavior. We might see less of what we call supervision among families where alcoholism is present versus families where it is not. So a family history of alcoholism may work through changing parenting behavior. Well, that parenting behavior then may, if you see the dotted line that goes across the top and down all the way to the right, you see that line between emotional distress and pathological involvement. We know that people, adolescents, who have lots of emotional distress, they experience lots of depression and anxiety, are prone to pathological alcohol involvement. But that tends to be worse among kids who, have, who are not exposed to ideal parenting strategies. So you see that dotted line from parenting behavior comes over and moderates that relationship between emotional distress and pathological involvement. So if you have a kid who's prone to emotional distress and also has uh, uh, parents who demonstrate less than ideal parenting uh, supervision and those sorts of issues, they're the ones that are at greater risk to go into pathological alcohol involvement. Looking at another path kind of across the middle of the figure there, we know that a family history of alcoholism may result in more life stress. So you see a direct solid line there. Family history of alcoholism leads to more life stress in those kids because their home environments tend to be more unpredictable. There may be more violence. They may be exposed to trauma. So we know there's more life stress. We know that that life stress can result in emotional distress. So some kids are going to respond to that with depression and anxiety and those sorts of things. And that emotional distress may lead to alcohol use. But you also notice there's a, there's a dotted line that comes from temperament and personality to that solid line between life stress and emotional distress, right in the middle of the figure. What that's saying is that the personality or temperament of the adolescent, him or herself, sort of changes that relationship between life stress and emotional dis, uh, distress. Some kids are going to have a personality that may be a buffer. Maybe they're just more calm, they're more resilient, and so when they experience life stress, they don't tend to result in as much depression and anxiety. Temperament or personality may be a protective factor for that particular pathway. So I hope that makes some sense. You can sort of pause the video and just sort of go through and think of all the different ways that um, a family history of alcoholism can result in pathological involvement. And this is just one example. You know, we can draw this between all sorts of things of, uh, let's say we had uh, gender and heart disease as the, the beginning and the end. Let's say we had a, um, a low SES and cancer outcomes. You could draw all kinds of different factors and pathways that go through this. Again, in this figure, the solid lines are mediators or the pathways through which it happens. That's how the story happens. Dotted lines or mediators are the risk or protective factors that may make something worse or better um, and change the outcome over time. So that's our brief introduction to the biopsychosocial model. Um, we'll be returning to this model over and over throughout the class because, like I say, this is the main organizing model for the entire field of health psychology.